I left school at the age of 15 and uh, it was inevitable I should take up fishing. Crab fishing, crab and lobster off the beach at Bee Sands. It's born and bred in, in one, I think, really. Father was a fisherman, he's been fishing all his life. My grandfather before that. I left school 15 months before my brother Fred, because uh, he was the other half of the venture at that time. Because father and uh, his brother, Arthur, had their own boat, obviously, and we started off with a boat about 17 foot six, I think it was. Being youngsters, I mean, it was myself, John Crocker, Michael Crispin, of the same age, and we used to sort of team up to launch our own boats. <laughs> that was how we first got it started, I think, and then the first trip at sea, we'd have a few pots around the shallower areas of the coastline. We had to get integrated with the main fleet, if you know what I mean. So we sort of crept in <laughs> to get our place in the, the fleet. When I first started, obviously, it was all willow crab pots. And that in itself was one of the first things that we had to achieve is being able to make a crab pot. It was done in two stages. Generally speaking, as there was two men aboard the boat, one would make the top half and the other half would do the bottom. The morning crab pots were always much more neater and, and a little more smaller than the afternoon. I sometimes wonder whether it's to do, <laughs> they've been on a scrumpy or not <laughs> over lunch. <laughs> when we first went off the beach with a bigger boat, father being a long time user of willow crab pots was reluctant to give up the, the um, art of making them. Partly because you could buy a whole willow grove. You didn't own it, you rented it off of the local farmer or whoever. But the point is for about 20 pounds or whatever it was, you could buy your whole seasons of willows for that amount of money, which made you 40 or 50 pots, which was about the average amount you used and had to be replaced every year. I must admit, I mean, there have been the times I do when you say a silent prayer. We were all in gear down off the start, and up come this blooming red torpedo. Came up, and one of the crew said, oh, whoa, stop, stop. And I stopped, and we looked over the side, and this thing, and just at that very minute, he slid away, you know? To be quite honest with you, this is when I really, really did feel frightened, because just at that time, there had been a scolloper in the area and he dredged up one of these things and it exploded. Of course, his dredges then, being towing it, would have been a considerable distance behind him, but apparently the blast lifted this trawler out of the water and dropped the back end of it and dropped it down again. Of course, all his dredges and everything were blown to bits. So I thought, well, what's going to happen once that thing hits the bottom? Is it going to blow up? <laughs> Fortunately, it didn't. <laughs> Everything went to London, Billingsgate, or Birmingham and places like that, all by rail. There was a couple of carriers down there then that used to take the, not just from us, you know, from the whole village and the whole sands and to Kingsbridge Railway Station. That's where it all went in those early days. In fact, there were so many crabs at certain times of the year going via Kingsbridge to various markets that the um, whole Courage itself, a special carriage for wet shellfish and that sort of thing, used to be just hitched up behind the existing train. So literally tons and tons of, of crab. 